and stay, don't leave. <laughs> I'm, I watch the tables fill and then I watch them unfill as it gets closer to 10. Let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, we thank and praise you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your glorious promises that we find in your word. We thank you, Lord, for your patience with us as we learn how to live in them. We thank you, Lord, um, that you never fail us, ever, ever, ever. And we praise you this day, Lord. This is your day, the day that we set aside to refresh, renew, and um, be um, revitalized in you. So bless this time that we have, Lord. Fill our hearts, fill our spirits up, Lord, today, that we might be uh, courageous, victorious, overcoming people that you promised uh, that we would be. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, hopefully you all have a study guide there. This is a Bible study you don't need to have been in all along. You can just jump in at any time, so keep inviting people. Today we're studying, of course, God's promise of grace. There's a table over here if people need to fill it up. Fill it up. All right. If you've been... I'll give people time to leave or come as they are. As you could tell, I really do have a teaching gift because I'm greatly distracted when there's <laughs> <laughs> comings and goings. All right, it's obvious that God's promises, if you've been uh, with us at all, that they relate to, they build on, they're dependent on one another, right? If you get the revelation of one promise, it's much, much easier to see how they work together, how the promises of God work together, and then how we can receive and apply them to our daily lives. For example, we've already looked at the promise of faith. And if you remember, it, re it shows us how we can tap into the mighty things of God. Faith leads to the promises of forgiveness and love and peace and salvation, all of which lead to a deeper understanding of what we're going to study today, which is grace. Ephesians 2.8, can someone read that good and loud? For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should hold. So that's a promise. It doesn't say promise, but it's a promise that it's by grace that we're saved. By the gift of God, it's the free gift of God that everyone in this room is saved. Grace cannot be experienced without faith. You'll get a measure of worldly grace, but you won't get the full revelation of grace except through faith in Jesus Christ. So we thank God for faith. Amen? Amen. We thank God for saving us. Martin Luther said, faith is a living, daring confidence in God's grace. So sure, so certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times over. That's what we can stake our trust in, in a God who gives freely. Faith is having confidence in God's grace. Confidence in a gift of God just because he wanted to give it. God gave grace just because he wanted to. Has anyone ever given a gift or done a favor for someone for no other reason than you wanted to? How many people have done that? Yep. How many people have been the recipient of something for no other reason than that someone wanted to bless you? You didn't do anything. It just came right out of the blue. Try to remember just for a moment what it felt like to receive just because. Not because it was your birthday, not because it was Christmas, not because you had done them a favor, but just because you're you. What did it feel like? Marvelous. Marvelous. Hmm? Marvelous. Marvelous. Wonderful. Anything else? Just marvelous, wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. For me, it really humbles me. It's, 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 it, it humbles me. Um, try to remember what it felt like to do that for someone else. What did that feel like for you? That felt good too. Yes, it does. Now, think about how God feels when he gives to us just because he wants to. Or how he feels when we actually receive what he gives to us. 
when we receive his promises, how good that makes him feel. If someone, if you give to someone and they go, thanks, but I don't really want that. Thanks, but I don't really deserve that. What does that make you feel like? <laughs> A little angry for some. We like to say, hey, don't steal my blessing. Receive what I have given to you. To be honest, that's changed the way I receive from people. I used to have a really hard time receiving anything because I felt so undeserving, because I had low self-esteem and I felt like I didn't deserve it. Plus, then I felt obligated to return the favor or to re return a gift to them. I thought that was just, that's what you did. That was common courtesy. Now I know that I'm undeserving. <laughs> that's a given. I know that. But the love and acceptance from another person isn't based on whether or not I deserve it. It's based on who I am in their eyes. Amen. And when we think of it that way, we can be much better receivers. I'm not talking about takers here. I'm talking about receivers. And that's how God gives his grace to us. It's not based on merit, but it's based on who we are to him and who we are in him. Grace is defined as unmerited divine assistance. And so God's grace includes his approval, his favor, his mercy, his pardon. And we, have, we are privileged people all because he wanted to, just because he wanted to. God's grace could be defined as love exemplified. His grace actually helps us understand the width and the length, the height and the depth of his infinite love. It's by grace that um, we can understand more of God. If we, don't un if we don't just receive this unmerited divine assistance, it's very hard to grow in God because we're always trying to earn it. <laughs> we're always trying to figure him out instead of having a relationship with him so that he can reveal himself to us. His grace can never, ever, ever be earned or repaid. Even if you spent your entire life trying to repay God for what he's done for you, you couldn't do it. And it doesn't really matter how um, full of gratitude all of us are, all put together for the grace that he's given to us, it would still be insufficient for the grace that we each receive on a daily basis. That's grace. And because of grace... Each one of us in this room has been granted privileged status as God's adopted children. We're children of the king. We're ambassadors of his kingdom. We're the apples of his, of his eye. We're his peculiar people. We are seated in heavenly places. We walk in his power right here on earth, all because of grace. And we can't talk about grace without actually talking about God's mercy because they go hand in hand. Mercy is defined as divine favor. It's this lenient, compassionate treatment, or it's not getting what we deserve. Does that make sense? Mercy is not getting what we deserve, or is, is not getting what we deserve, and grace is getting what we don't deserve. <laughs> The Bible describes God's mercy as being plentiful, new every, mo uh, every morning, and his mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 103 says he removes our transgressions far away from us, as far as the east is from the west, so far, and he remembers them no more. That's mercy. Mercy holds no grudges. It abstains from punishment or censure. God treats us as though it didn't happen. Mercy is then God's eternal grace. You see, God has always been full of mercy and grace, always. The Israelites experienced it in the wilderness. The, whole Bi the Bible tells us in Exodus uh, 15, 16, 16, that uh, the whole congregation complained against Moses and Aaron. They, they, didn't, they thought they were complaining against Moses and Aaron. They were really complaining against God, and God told them that later on. But they were complaining against Moses and Aaron. You can just hear them. What's up with Moses and Aaron? What kind of leaders are they? Did you hear the last decision that they made? What kind of leaders are they anyway? And this food out here, it's terrible. <laughs> we knew change would be hard, but this is harder than hard. 
we, should have, we shouldn't have trusted them. We should have just stayed in Egypt because at least we, even though we were slaves, at least we ate well. You can hear their grumbling and their complaining if you just kind of go there in your head. Instead of giving the people, though, what they deserved, God had mercy. He, he didn't kill them. <laughs> and he gave them grace. He told Moses that he heard their complaints, so he was going to rain down food from heaven for them. And he said they can receive it every single day. Every morning they can get up, go get what they need for the day, and then on the sixth day, collect two days' worth, and they'll never be hungry. And he also said he'd make quail fly in at night so they'd have meat. They complained, and he gave them, he had mercy on them. He fed them. What a God. What grace, what mercy. What promises we have even here in 2014 from God. This promise is reiterated there in Psalm 105, 37 to 45. It says, The Lord brought his people out of Egypt, loaded, loaded with silver and gold. And not one among the tribes of Israel even stumbled. Understand, they were loaded with stuff. And they didn't even stumble. Egypt was glad when they were gone, for they feared them greatly. The Lord spread a cloud above them as a covering and gave them a great fire to light the darkness. They asked for meat, and he sent them quail. He satisfied their hunger with manna, bread from heaven. He split open a rock, and water gushed out to form a river through the dry wasteland. For he remembered his sacred promise for his servant Abraham. So he brought his people out of Egypt with joy his chosen ones with rejoicing. He gave his people the lands of pagan nations and they harvested crops that others had planted. All this happened so that they would follow his decrees and obey his instructions. Praise the Lord. This tells us how we should respond to the grace of God. Follow his decrees, obey his instructions and praise him. We praise him for this grace that continues to pour down on us. There's a wonderful story of grace that came out of one of the worst times in American history during the Great Depression. Uh, Fiorella, or Fiorello LaGuardia was the mayor of New York City. And the New, New Yorkers called him um, the little flower because he, was, he only stood five foot four and he always wore a carnation in his lapel. And he was a colorful character. He would ride the New York City um, fire trucks. He raided speakeasies with the police department. He um, took entire orphanages to baseball games. He, um, when the new, I would have loved to have been there for this. When the newspapers went on strike, he went on the radio and read the funnies to the kids <laughs> who were listening. One bitter cold night in January of 1935, the mayor decided to go to one of the worst areas in New York City um, and relieve the judge for a night and tell him he could go home and spend it with his family. He would take over the bench himself. A tattered old woman was brought before him, charged with stealing a loaf of bread. She told LaGuardia that her daughter's husband had deserted, that her, grand or her daughter was sick, and that her two grandchildren were starving. The shopkeeper she stole from refused to drop charges, even after hearing of her distress. He reiterated to the mayor, it's a real bad neighborhood, Your Honor. She's got to be punished to teach others around here a lesson. LaGuardia sighed as he turned to the woman and he said, he's right, I've got to punish you. The law makes no exceptions, $10 or 10 days. But even as he pronounced sentence, he reached in his pocket for a bill and threw it in his hat. And he said, here's the $10 fine, which I now remit. And furthermore, I'm going to fine everyone else in the courtroom 50 cents for living in a city where a person has to steal bread so that her grandchildren can eat. Mr. Bailiff, collect the money and give it to the defendant. The following day, the New York City newspapers reported that $47.50 was turned over to a bewildered old lady who had stolen a loaf of bread to feed her starving grandchildren. Fifty cents of that was contributed by the red-faced grocery store owner, while 70 petty criminals, people with traffic violations, and even New York policemen each paid 50 cents and gave the mayor a standing ovation when it was all said and done. 
Now, did the elderly lady in this story uh, get what she deserved? <coughs> the answer is no. She did wrong, didn't she? She stole. Maybe she had a good reason, but stealing is stealing regardless of the reason. Punishment would have seemed to be the order of the day, right? However, the mayor serving as a judge was in a superior position. He chose to show mercy and to extend her grace. He showed mercy by not giving her what she deserved, and he extended grace by going above and, above, uh, above and beyond and giving her what she did not deserve. All she had to do was receive it. Christian financial consultant and author Larry Burkett told a story from his own life about mercy. He leased an office building um, in early in his career, proved to be a nightmare. The foundation had been improperly constructed. So the office builder, building was literally sinking into the ground about three inches every year. After more than those three years of putting up with assorted problems, including power failures and water leakage, Burkett moved his business to another location when his lease was up. Two months after he left, he received a call from his former landlord demanding that Burkett remodel and repaint his former office space. Burkett refused, but the former landlord continued to call with his demands. Burkett consulted with an attorney to see if there was any grounds for this, and the attorney said, you're, you're fine, don't do anything. <coughs> his son, however, offered different counsel, reminding his father that the landlord and his wife had lost their only child a few years earlier and still suffered from that tragedy. Burkett had often commented how he would have liked to have helped them heal, so his son suggested this might be an opportunity to do just that. Burkett took some time, considered it, prayed, and decided to commit several thousand dollars to restore a virtually non-usable building. It certainly wasn't fair, was it, to fulfill the former landlord's demands, but it was an act of mercy, not bringing harassment charges against him, and it was an act of grace by going above and beyond giving the landlord what he did not deserve. See, mercy and grace almost always go hand in hand. And it's God's promise to every single one of us. I wrote the most common acronym for grace on there, God's riches at Christ's expense. How many people learned that years ago? And that's an awesome gift. Um, I always go, but what are those riches? And when I ask that, we have a hard time coming up with more than two or three. But today, I wanted to come up with an acronym as I studied and as I prayed about grace to remind us of what those riches in grace do for us every day of our lives so that we could apply his grace to our lives. And so you have the second acronym there, by grace, God gives, he reminds, he acts, he creates, and he empowers us. And now we're going to look at each one of those. So the grace, by grace, God gives to us. Grace is actually a gift that keeps on giving. Psalm 68 says that the Lord daily loads us with benefits. There it is again, that word loads. Anybody ever carry a heavy load? I've had grandkids with me over the last weekend, and some of them are really heavy loads. <laughs> and they want to be carried all the time. And I am empowered to do so. Um, but the Lord daily loads his people with benefits. He, he's heavy on us. Psalm 103 lists some of those benefits that come from his grace. Those are mercy, forgiveness, healing, redemption, tender mercy, satisfaction, renewing of our youth, and protection. If you want to read what got some of the great riches that has, have come to us at Christ's expense, read Psalm 103. Verse 8 says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and what? Abounding in mercy. There's very few things we abound in in this world, if we, if we really think of it. If I asked how many of you are abounding in money? Oh, yeah, me. <laughs> or abounding in health, as I wipe my nose. 
Other verses declare, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those who fear him. But the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on who? And his righteousness to children's children. What a legacy we have opportunity to give from generation to generation to generation if we'll just grab hold of these promises. God gives and gives and gives. His grace is endless. We can't even fathom that, but at least we've got to start trying. By grace, God gives us every spiritual blessing. Someone read Ephesians 1, 2 to 6. Ah, that's beautiful, isn't it? Every spiritual blessing, all because he wanted to, for his grace, because of his grace and his glory. By gra grace, God gives us all sufficiency in all things. 2 Corinthians 9, 8. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you always have all sufficiency in all things, <coughs> Notice the word all. Grace gives all. All. Pretty simple. By grace, God gives good things. Psalm 84, 11. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No, no good thing shall be withheld from I could probably go on for a few hours about why we don't see all those good things, but I'm just going to talk about God's grace today <laughs> instead. But um, his word is so sure, so strong, so powerful, if we'll just live in it, we'll just receive what he has to say to us. Secondly, grace reminds us. By grace, we are reminded every single day of how much God loves us. By grace, we are reminded every single day of how much God forgives us. By grace, we're reminded every single day that he redeemed us, was crucified for us, lives in us and for us, blesses and heals us, protects, defends, fights for us, plans and prospers us, provides for us, guides and leads us, walks and talks with us. Every single day, God reminds us of those riches that we receive by grace because of Christ's sacrifice for us. Grace reminds us continuously if we'll just open up our eyes and our hearts and let him reveal the many things that he does for us. Thirdly, grace acts. Grace is an action. Grace is active. Grace allows us to live and move in him. It's by grace that we actually live and move and have our feeling. Grace, for example, acts through forgiveness. God, we know that he forgives every single sin, right? When we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus paid the price for everything you've ever done or will ever do. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> a woman told the story of how her father had sexually abused her as a small child. She grew up, she became a Christian, she overcame the emotional damage. She eventually married. And years later, after her own children were full grown, she received a letter from her father saying that he, too, had become a Christian. And he had asked God for forgiveness for all of his sins. He also realized, though, that he had sinned against her. And he was writing to ask her for her forgiveness. Feelings she did not know were there suddenly surfaced. It wasn't fair, she thought bitterly. He should pay for what he has done. It was all too easy for him, and now he was going to be part of the family of God? 
She was sure her home church was busy killing the fatted calf for her father, and she'd be invited to come to the party. She was angry. She was hurt. She was resentful. She was bitter. And then she had a dream. She saw her father standing on an empty stage, and above him appeared the hands of God holding a white robe. She recognized it at once because in the dream, she was wearing a robe just like it. And as the robe began to descend toward her father, she woke up with tears streaming down her face. You see, she realized that the only way she could get past this was to realize that her earthly father was now the same as she. They were the same in God's sight. God's grace for him, God had grace for him just as he'd had grace for her. And by realizing that, she was finally able to forgive her father. Grace. It's a free gift. It's not based on anything we've done. It's not based on anything we've not done. And it's not about what we deserve. Grace is about mercy, not fairness. Grace is for the last, just like it's for the first. Grace is for the worst of sinners. Grace is for the least of sinners. Grace acts through forgiveness. It is an action word. Grace also acts through cleansing. God cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Please don't miss or just gloss over the word all. All unrighteousness. He cleansed us so that we can enjoy him and he can enjoy us. Do you understand that? He cleansed us not so that we can just be clean and ta-da. He cleanses us so that we can enjoy him and he can enjoy time with us. God loves us. And as our father, he wants to spend time with us, just like we want to spend time with our children. In Jeremiah, God says he will cleanse us from all our iniquity by which we have ever sinned against him. That's an act of grace. In Ezekiel, God says he will sprinkle clean water on us and we will be clean. He will cleanse us from all filthiness and idols. What a difference that would make in our lives if we just let him sprinkle us clean. That's an act of grace. Ephesians, in Ephesians, we're cleansed by the washing of water by the word. That's an act of grace. In 1 John 1, 9, we read, If we confess our sins, which is what I just said, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Grace acts in our world today through cleansing. Grace acts through favor. Repeatedly, the Bible says God gave or showed grace and favor to his people. Now, all you have to do is just read a little bit of the Bible to realize God's people don't deserve grace. Amen? Amen. But you, if, you, if, if you just did a Google search on how much grace God gave and showed to his people in the word of God, you'd be amazed. It is amazing grace. <laughs> Ephesians says he raised us up to sit in heavenly places. Now, having a place in the throne room of God is pretty presti prestigious, right? Pretty favorable. How many of us live like we're seated in heavenly places? He raised us up to sit in heavenly places. Doesn't that change? It needs to change our perspective. He adopted us into his family and told us to call him Abba Father. That's an act of grace. Anyone remember seeing photos of young John Kennedy Jr. playing under the desk in the Oval Office while his dad, the President of the United States, worked? To John John, this important man was just daddy. God is our daddy, and he wants to shower us with his favor. He told us where to come when we are in need so that we can obtain mercy and grace. How many of us just complain that God's... <laughs> this just came to me. Pastor Mark used to work on a farm to pay for his high school tuition. And uh, so he worked for a farmer. And, you know, when you're farming, well, it doesn't really matter what you're doing in life. Bad things happen, right? And he said, 
um, he would always say to, he'd, they'd be sitting having a tomato soup for lunch, and he'd always proclaim, why is God so ugly to me? Why is God so ugly to me? He could only see the bad. And God says we have to go to him to find and obtain mercy and grace. Yep, we could all sit here and tally up all the bad things that are going on in our lives right now. And I bet we'd actually like to. We'd probably like to outdo one another. <laughs> Show you how bad my life. You're, you think your life is bad? Wait till you hear my life. Oh, wouldn't it be great if we'd outdo one another in demonstrating and talking about God's mercy and his grace? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. You see, we don't just go to him to, to get our need met. You see that there? We go boldly to obtain mercy and to find grace. <laughs> There's a difference between just going to ask God to just get, get rid of the stuff, the stuff that's going on in our lives. Go to him to experience him, to experience grace, to experience mercy. He'll help in the time of need. God wants to show us his favor, and that's grace. That's love in action. Also, God creates the C in the acronym for grace. Grace is life-giving. It creates a new heart in us. Grace creates a fresh start every day. Do you understand that? If today is not going so well, it's okay, because tomorrow's a new day. Grace creates adventure. Because we get to be risk, -taker, risk takers in this life of grace in Jesus. Grace creates new opportunities for us. Grace creates a fearlessness in us. Grace creates strength in us. God is a creating God. And so with grace comes creativity. And it's God's creativity in us. His mercies are new every morning, not old. Not recreated. His mercies are new. And when God says new, he means new. God said in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Next week we're going to talk about strength, the promise of, str of God's strength. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Notice it doesn't say complain about our infirmities. <clears throat> It's hard, but it's simple. When my mother in love was living with us in hospice, every day became more emotionally difficult as we watched her in a state of helplessness, as we witnessed the steady decline, as we worked with an endless parade of caretakers and nurses and aides and family coming and going. Oftentimes, not often times, often every moment of the day, many times during the day, I would have to say to myself, I can do this. I can do this because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God, your grace is sufficient. I'm weak. You are strong. Your strength is made perfect in weakness one day at a time. I had to talk the word. I had to speak the word to myself to keep going. I had to remember how life-giving God is and how he creates newness every day. Every single day I failed, and every single day he continued ne never to fail me. He strengthened my resolve to do what needed to be done. And that means anything that needed to be done, it was his strength that made it possible. He has done the same thing in myriad situations throughout my life. And I'm sure if I open the mic here, you'd all have similar testimonies of God's faithfulness by grace. By turning to God in times of weakness and need, by looking and longing for his creativity in our lives, we will, we will, we will experience his grace in greater dimension. And lastly, grace empowers not only are we adopted into the family of God, we are empowered people of God. Do you get that? We're not helpless children. We're empowered people. Second Peter 1, 2-4. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and goodness. Through the knowledge of him, we call us by glory and virtue, and which have been given to us Nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through 
Notice how that starts though. Grace and peace be multiplied. Not just added to you, not just live in the grace that you've had since you came to know Jesus, but it, would it be multiplied in your life? There's no end to his grace, remember? We're not old people in Christ. We are empowered people in Christ. Grace, God's grace empowers us with an amazing three-faceted spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. 2 Timothy 1, 7 and 9. According to his own purpose and grace. I, I remember just speaking that over Pastor Mark's um, father when he was having memory issues. I would, speak, I would speak, God didn't give you a spirit of fear, but of love and of power and of a sound mind. And I wasn't saying, oh, well, if I speak it, it'll be. I was trusting in God to preserve him and to hold him until he decided to take him home. God's grace empowers us with the whole armor of God according to Ephesians 6. That's amazing grace. That is empowering grace. We, all of us, have the armor of God by which to live and move and have our being. You see, everything God has ever done is the result of his great love and grace. His great love for us and then his desire to pour out riches on his people at Christ's expense. Everything you will ever need or want is abundantly available because of his great love and his great grace. And so as we spend time meditating on the grace and favor of God, we will learn to depend on him in all situations. If we don't spend time meditating on all of these things that I've shown you here, that's just a little bit of what he has to give to us, when, that, when those times of need come, we won't know how to depend on him. Because we'll say, yep, yeah, by grace, we're saved. And people go, well, what is that grace? Well, I don't know. It's just really good stuff from God. But we want to know what those things, what, what, it, what, what they are. What's the substance of grace? And hopefully I've given you some clues to, to push you to press into the word even more fully. God wants us to trust him enough that we will cast every care on him so that he could show himself strong on our behalf. His word explains that he wants to spend eternity showing us the exceeding great riches of his grace. And I always love when I see that because I'm like, well, eternity starts now, so I don't have to wait till I get to heaven to start experiencing and getting a fuller revelation of what this grace is really like. God longs to bless us abundantly. 1 Corinthians 1, 3, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Those just aren't the words of, of a writer. Those are inspired words from Holy Spirit trying to penetrate our lives in 2014 so that we'll receive his grace new today. Paul Tillich Tillich, or Tillich, a German-American Christian theologian and philosopher, wrote his impression of an experience of grace like this. He said, grace strikes us when we are in great pain and restlessness. It strikes us when we walk through the valley of a meaningless and empty life. It strikes us when year after year the longed-for perfection does not appear when the old compulsions reign within us as they have for decades, when despair destroys all joy and courage. Sometimes, at that moment, a wave of light breaks into our darkness, and it's as though a great voice were saying, you're accepted, you're accepted, you're accepted by that which is greater than you, one that you do not know. Don't try to do anything. Don't perform anything. Don't intend anything. Simply accept the fact that you are accepted. If that happens to us, he says, we experience grace. I love that he used the word strike in connection with grace because that's what happens if you really experience it. It literally strikes us 
and you stopped and say, hey, what just hit me? <laughs> Something amazing just hit me. And so in closing, I want to, to leave some thoughts with you. The next time you wonder what God thinks of you, the next time you might feel undeserving, the next time you have a hard time receiving all the benefits of grace that he has freely given you, think on grace. Think on grace. God's grace gives us all things. The G, God's grace gives us. God's grace reminds us that he did it once and for all. All we have to do is receive. God's grace acts so that we can forgive, so that we can walk in purity, so that we can be his favored people, and then share that with others so that they can be forgiven and pure and favored. God's grace creates a portrait of new life that God daily splashes with his artistry. Start looking for God's creativity. I love this time of year, but it's amazing how many people wake up and go, oh, I just love this time of year, and it lasts for like a week, right, of really vibrant colors. But we can do that every day. Just look for what God is doing. Look. And God's grace empowers us to take our seat, to take our authority, to pick up our weapons of warfare and just go for it. No holding back. We've got his grace. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. May the amazing grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with every single one of you here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.